Welcome to Soul Food, a ministry of Calvary Chapel, Princeton, West Virginia. In Psalms chapter 34, uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> I've been studying 35, and so I'm like, keep messing myself up. Um, before we venture into this, let's pray for a second, and we'll be then enjoying this psalm. Father, we thank you that you brought us here. We thank you that you reign on high, that uh, not only are we looking forward to worshiping you forevermore, but we want to be those who abide in you today, that are worshiping you moment to moment, whether we're doing the dishes or driving our car or struggling through whatever it is. I want to abide in you. Because it's as we see your face, as we look to you, that we see and experience your joy and your peace. Lord, as we venture into this psalm, we pray that, that we would abide in your peace as David teaches us. In Jesus' name, amen. That is David the king, not me. <laughs> Got to clarify. <laughs> uh, Psalms 34. Now, uh, some time back we were in Psalms 25. This, like Psalms 25, is an acrostic. So every verse is a different Hebrew letter. Um, this is a uh, wisdom, wisdom teaching. Um, Psalm 25 was a lament. So... Uh, whereas this one is more of a thanksgiving psalm. And the difference between the two is with a lament, it is anticipating the deliverance of God, while here it is praising God for the deliverance that I've, I've received. Does that make sense? So it's a little bit different uh, from the two psalms. Um, but in this case, uh, there is a, a psalm of praise that responds to a specific deliverance. Um, in Psalm, in verse one, uh, in the intro, it says, this is a Psalm of David when he feigned madness before Abimelech who drove him away and uh, he departed. That is a reference to 1 Samuel chapter 21. Uh, for those of you who remember, uh, in 1 Samuel, uh, David was running from Saul and he goes to uh, one of the synagogues or, and, and he sees the, the priest and he says, hey, I need some bread. And do you have a sword here? And what does he say? He says, well, yeah, are you pure? Can you? And he says, yeah, we, we're on the run. We haven't done anything to make ourselves unpure. So uh, here's the food, here's the bread. And the only sword we have here is Goliath's sword. And so he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll take that. So he takes Goliath's sword and he runs away to Gath. What, where was Goliath from? Gath. Gath. <laughs> so David is running off to the Philistines to Gath. And at that time, he is like, I'm going to the enemy. What do I do? And he, he pretends to be insane. So he's running around with Goliath's sword. And it says he's drooling. And they, they basically bring him to the king. Um, and there's a discrepancy here. In this chapter, it refers to Abimelech, whereas in 1 Samuel, uh, the name is Achish. Abimelech is probably a title, whereas Achish is actually the name of the king. And so that's, that answers that discrepancy. Um, kind of like Pharaoh is a title, Abimelech is a, is a title. Um, anyway, so he gets to Gath. Uh, he's got this sword. And the guy, the, the ruler says, I don't have time for this. He's clearly lost it. Uh, just get him out of my presence. And rather than being killed by the enemy, he ends up getting released and he runs off to the cave of Adullam, which is where we think this actual psalm is penned. Um, so from Gath, which is 
the city of Goliath, who he slew when he was younger, to the cave of Adullam. Now remember, at the same time, he's still on the run from Saul. So he's been released from one thing, but he's still struggling. And that's kind of where we're at in the psalm. Verse one says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul will make its boast in the Lord. The humble will hear it and rejoice. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. David is resolved to praising the Lord despite the circumstances he's in and in light of the circumstances he's in. He has been released from the enemy He's still on the run, but he's going to praise the Lord. And he's calling everybody to join in the same celebration with him. Interesting, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1 quotes the psalm, uh, verse 30 through 31. He says, by his doing, you are in Christ who became to us the wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption so that just it is, as it is written, let him who boasts boast in the Lord. Now, what's the celebration? That despite the situation you're in, God is redeeming you. He's bringing you out of the troubles of this life. And he is the one that we can boast in. If you go on to 2 Corinthians 11, uh, he, he says, if I have to boast, I will boast in what pertains to my weakness. Because in my weakness, I'm made strong. He is my strength. Thessalonians 5 says, in everything we're to give thanks for this is the will of Christ Jesus concerning you. We are to be thankful and remember the things that he's brought us through because that empowers us to continue to endure the things that we're going through. It's the past that we're remembering that help us get through the future and the longing for what he's promised. Romans, uh, I'm jumping ahead. Yeah, no, Romans. Uh, <laughs> we know that all things work together for the good of those who love him, who love God and are called according to his purpose. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Now, do you feel like conquerors today? Because that's what he's declaring. We are more than conquerors because of not what we have done, but what he has done for you. Verse four says, I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Where did it start? It started with seeking the Lord. What does Matthew, Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then all this other stuff will be added. The first priority, the first focus is the Lord. And I think it's really interesting that David, David never says, I wasn't afraid. We will have fears. And there are times when fear is, is really there. And this word for fear uh, is magora, where we get gore, horror from. That's David's experience. He is horrified in the situation that he was in, about to be killed. Yet, in the midst of that, he looked to God, and that brought him peace. The word deliverance is literally this idea of being snatched up uh, in the last moment. He allowed David to endure a little bit of fear so that he would look to him. And sometimes we are in situations where it's really hard. And we are called in the midst of that to look to him. And here David is saying, I did that. And here's the result. He was delivered so that he would no longer be afraid. And there's two things, two ideas. One is that he was delivered from the fear that, it, that captured him. And secondly, he was delivered from the situation that he was in. And there are times when God does each of those things for us. He allows us to have fear and endure. And then there are times when he brings us out of the things that we're afraid of. 
and he says, I'm gonna, we're gonna overcome this. And he brings us to another place. In both situations, it's when we're weak and we look to him that we're empowered. Verse five says, they looked to him and were radiant. Their faces will never be ashamed. Who are they? Ever look at the context here? It is the humble, from verse two, who hear me boast in the Lord. They are those who in turn are praising God for what he is doing in your life, in David's life, in the situations that he is showing himself powerful. Now, this is kind of a reference back to Moses when his face shone when he went up to the mountain and he came down and they were like, ooh, something different has happened. You've seen the face of God. But also Isaiah 60 says, arise and shine for your light has come. The glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, gross darkness, the people, but the Lord will arise upon you and his glory shall be seen upon you and the Gentiles shall come to thy light. As we seek the Lord, as we see his face, that radiance happens in our life. The countenance of our face changes because we are at peace with what's going on. He brings us joy. And we saw that when Stephen was stoned. It says his face radiated and shone. Second Corinthians 3 says, we all with unveiled face behold as in the mirror the glory of the Lamb are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. That's where we're to be. We're to being, be being transformed into a new image that people look to and see hope in our countenance. Verse six is the poor man, this poor man, cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. David was desperate. He was destitute, living as an outcast in the midst of the enemy, posing as an insane man. And he cried to the Lord, and he saved him, and he can do the same for us today. Because verse seven says, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues them. This is a different word, fear, here. This is, uh, instead of Megora in the earlier verses, this is yare, meaning reverence the Lord. The fear of the Lord, the respect of the Lord, those who honor God. There is protection in that. There is a rescuing in the midst of, of entrusting ourselves to the Lord. Interesting, this chapter and the next chapter are the only chapters in Psalms that reference this angel of the Lord. Um, it's here once, and then in chapter 25, there's, there's two, two, it's referenced twice. Um, and we see some interesting things as, as you look at that reference in, in history. Uh, Genesis, um, the angels of the Lord showed up at, his, at uh, Jacob's camp. This is right before Jacob wrestles with God. And he says, now our camp has become two camps. It is the camp of the Lord. And he starts struggling to, to go back to Esau, and then he sends these messengers. Uh, I, I'll let you think about this one. The angels, the word angel is messenger. Um, they show up at the camp, the angels, the messengers of God. And then in the next two verses, <coughs> Jacob uh, sends messengers to Esau, and they return. There's some interesting, something interesting going there. Is it his own messengers? Is it God's messengers that he's sending? I, I, I find that fascinating. Anyway, 
Little aside, <laughs> Exodus 23, behold, I'm going to send an angel before you to guard you along the way and bring you into the place which I have prepared. That was as they're going out from Exodus. The promise is I'm going to send someone to protect you in the midst of all that's going on. Now, many believe these this references are the pre-incarnate Jesus, which is totally a valid uh, thing. But it's interesting that the word is messenger. It's the messenger of the Lord. He who proclaims the word of the Lord. I think it's interesting. The Hebrews distinguishes Jesus from the angels, saying, are not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who are who will inherit salvation there is a protection of god he is sending out ministering spirits to you for those who will inherit salvation interesting if you go on The word uh, messenger, we are now to be messengers. We are to be those proclaiming the word of the Lord. We are to be those who surround one another to comfort each other. So there is a sense that we become the encampment of the work of the Lord around each other and we build up each other and God has encamped the church around you today along with his angels and so as you are the administering spirit at times be that speak the truth help those who are in fear encourage Speak the truth in love. Verse 8 says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. The idea isn't just to take a bite and be like, hmm, that was nice. The idea of tasting here is to experience the fullness of who God is, the abundance, the variation. You know, when you go to a taste testing, whether it's cheese or wine or whatever, whatever it is, you go in, you, you visual, visually see whatever you're tasting, you check the, the, the you know, different textures and and you smell it, you experience the bouquet of it, you taste it from different parts of your tongue, and then you swallow it. Or you spit it out, <laughs> depending on what you're tasting. <laughs> That's the idea. We are to, he's calling for an immersion, not just a, a sampling in the Lord taste, experience all the elements of who he is. Interesting, First Peter 2 says, if indeed you have tasted the kindness of the Lord, what's the verses before say? Two, one and two say, lay aside malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby it, if indeed you have tasted it. Well, what do you do after you get that first taste? You cleanse your palate. And then you take a real sampling because now you can enjoy all the different notes of whatever it is you're trying. And it's the same with God. He says, you experience God on one level. Now, purify yourself and cleanse yourself so that you can experience the richness of it in a new light with clean palate. Like newborn babes, become those who 
just want to experience it, that are nourished by it and grown by him. Experience him, taste and see that he is good. Verse 9 says, Fear the Lord, you his saints. For those who fear him, there is no want. The young lions lack and suffer hunger. But they who seek the Lord shall not be in want of any good thing. Again, this is the Yahweh, the reverence, fear. You know, a lion's offspring are required to go out and hunt for themselves. And, and they're kind of, when, when they capture something, they're the, the main lion takes his lion's share and the offspring get the leftovers, whatever they can fight for. That's not the way God works. He desires for us and calls us to faith as he provides. He doesn't take the lion's share. He gives his children the abundance. Ultimately, we have no want because he provides everything. And as we get that through our head, that he has already provided, everything that we have was already his. And he's given it to you. It wasn't yours to start with. And we think, oh, we've worked for it and we've, we've, we've acquired this. No, he gave it to you out of his grace, out of his mercy, out of his love, out of his compassion. Philippians said, I have learned to be content in all circumstances. He says, I've learned the secret. What's the secret? I can do all things through him who strengthens me because I trust him. I have entrusted myself to him knowing that he has provided. He has got me to the place I am today. And so I can just glory in him. What happens? We first taste, then we become born again into the family as babes longing for him, desperate for the Lord, the pure milk of his word. Now as children, we are to be growing in that fear, in that respect, in that understanding of what it means to honor the Lord. That's what he's calling to. Growing up in his image. Romans 12 says that we are being transformed by the renewing of our mind. To do that, we have to draw near and listen to the teacher. We have to abide in his word. Verse 11 says, Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is the man who desires life and loves length of days that he may seek God? Keep your tongue from evil, your lips from speaking deceit, and depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. It's interesting. David doesn't define the fear of the Lord as an emotional thing. He defines this as an, or, or even as an attitude, but as an active response. This is how you fear the Lord. This is how you respect the Lord in your actions. It's not that you emotionally are, are controlled by it. It's that you have now departed from evil. We are guarding our tongue and we're seeking and pursuing peace. You know, it says here, who is the man who desires life? Not everybody desires life. Often, we get weary with this world. We get frustrated with the evil that we see around us. We get just distracted. But the reality is, part of the reason that happens 
is because we've lost our focus from looking to the Lord. We don't often want this because we're focusing on the negative aspects of what God has given you off of what his creation is. And the reality is, as we do that, we are focusing on atrophy, which is not life at all. It is the death that is becoming this world. As opposed to focusing on Christ, who is life. He has come to give you life abundantly. And as we lose focus on that abundance, on who he is, we get distracted with the atrophy of this world. And we lose our longing for life. We long for something else. He says, he who desires life is the one who is listening, who is seeking the Lord. For David, the pro prospect perspective is to see life more and more by looking to God more and more. John 10 says, The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you may have life and you may have it more abundantly. Where is your focus? What are you longing for? Is there something coming to steal your joy? Could it be your focus is in the wrong place? And I think that happens for all of us at different times. We all lose our focus on the Lord. He says, get that back to perspective. Focus on the Lord. And all this other stuff will fade away and we will have the right heart so that we can minister to the people we need to minister to and be that administering messenger. What does that look like? First Peter 3 quotes it, retelling the same idea. Guard your words. Guard your actions. Seek and pursue peace. That's what the focus is. It's a call of dedication to the things that produce life as opposed to that which brings atrophy and ultimately death. Verse 15 says, The eyes of the Lord are towards the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against evildoers to cut off the memory of them from the earth. You see the contrast? God is, sees it all, both sides. And he hears all of it. And the goal of the gospel is to bring the fallen to righteousness back to God. Ultimately, not everybody is going to turn to his holiness. Not everybody longs for good things. So we see this image of the wrath to come. His final judgment that he can ultimately wipe away every tear. It is for those who long for life. You can't allow the atrophy to continue. And if you are a part of that atrophy, you will be removed. <coughs> because he can't let it grow. It is his grace to those who desire life. We look at the judgment as something else. We don't look at his grace for us. We don't see that often 
in right perspective because we're not looking to God. We're looking for joy and happiness and abundance. Yet when people are not craving that, it's destructive. And God will not let destructive things continue. He will remove it ultimately. So that the things that are causing that atrophy and destruction can't cause it anymore. They can't cause any more pain, any more destruction. He'll remove their ability to continue to reproduce the evil that they do reproduce. It's his mercy. Verse 7 says, The righteous cry, and the Lord hears and delivers them out of their troubles, and the Lord is near to the brokenhearted. He saves those who are crushed in spirit. He is a God that sees us as we're struggling. First Peter says to humble yourselves under the mighty hand of the Lord, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. God meets us in our weakness, in our pain, and he leads us into peace and deliverance. How does he do that? Because we have cast that anxiety, that pain, that struggle on him. And we have entrusted him with all of it. It is an act of faith that God is in control. He created it all. He's doing the work. And we can trust him with it. And we can rest in that faith. Verse 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Interesting, there's a change here from they to him. Who is he? Jesus. John 19, he kept all his bones, right? This is prophetic of what Jesus has done on the cross. He delivers them out of all their afflictions. He is our Passover lamb. He is our righteousness. He is our deliverer. And he has come. Verse 21, evil shall slay the wicked and those who hate the righteousness will be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants and none of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. What's the difference? One entrusts to God and the other entrusts to themselves. Evil is self-condemning and self-destructive And ultimately, it will be cut off. And that process should start with the work of the cross. He desires to transform you every day into his new image, his present image. God has overcome this world The evil of this world will not stand. But he has called us to forgiveness, to grace. We're no longer condemned, but we are forgiven children. We are heirs to the throne. He has pulled us out of the enemy territory. Put our feet back in the promised land. Now there's all kinds of struggles in the midst of the promised land for David from here on out. But he's home. And for us, you are home. That's where you need to abide in him. Romans 8 says, There is therefore 
now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You are to abide in him and not live in condemnation. He has done a work and continues to do that work. And so having done that, we can celebrate today that he is the miracle worker in our lives. Thank you, Lord, that you have done a great work. We know that you are meeting us in the struggles we have. But we can look back and say, you have done wonderfully to bring us to where we are today. It's by your might, by your power, by your spirit. We praise you, Lord. We just worship you as we close. May you be glorified as we go out from here. In Jesus' name, amen.